You're listening to Sarah Hagen backstage with interviews and insights from years inside the music industry. Join Sarah as she talks with masters of their crafts, finding out what makes them tick both inside and outside of the music business. This week, Sarah talks with... with me, Mark Pusey. Welcome to Sarah Hagen Backstage. My guest today, Mark Pusey, is not only an incredible studio and live musician playing with such acts as Ed Sheeran, Leona Lewis, Tom Jones, Ollie Murs, just to name a few, but he is also a voiceover artist, a member of the RNLI, and a deep cave diver, as well as being the voice of the intro to Sarah Hagen Backstage. So come along with me as we catch up with Mark Pusey. Mark Pusey, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me. It's quite a list of folk you've had so far. So I'm very proud, very happy and proud to be able to. Thank you. Absolutely. And, th- you know, thanks for giving your time today. And I know you've been very, very busy lately. And so we will talk about all the things that you've had going on. But first off, how have you been through this whole quarantine and... um the virus and everything how have you been yeah i mean i i got it in january let me get this right january 2020 so 18 months ago uh, i got it uh i just came back from a holiday what i call my annual leave nothing really goes on the first two weeks of january so um i always go away every year and then I'll, i came back and i was like wow I'm, i feel really jet lagged this is crazy um and then for three weeks i was just not uh, three days i was just knocked on my ass um and then it it kind of just, it, it went away. It was like a bad flu. And then I woke up one morning. I was like, oh, I was sick yesterday, but today I feel okay. And that was it. And then um, my, my folks got it. I went to go and see my folks straight after my holiday, not knowing, you know, in January, nobody had any idea what this right. thing was, or even that it existed. And come the end of January, beginning of February, we started to hear that there was something happening in China. And, you know, uh, and my folks got it. And they're obviously much older. They're in their 70s now. And, um, and they, they came down with it pretty bad, you know. Um, I, I was on the FaceTime to them and at one stage my dad was like, oh yeah, your mum's next door sleeping. I'm like, she wasn't, I could hear her coughing and it was just a bit reluctant to take oh. me in, she was super sick. And, um, but yeah, they got over it and uh, I, I sort of got it out of the way early doors. But um, yeah, it was, it was, it's, 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 it's really killed a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of people off. I, there are friends who are players who I, I, you know, sort of grew up playing with who, have said, oh yeah, you know, man, I'm, I'm knocking it on the head. I've got a job with my brother's insurance company and I get a company car and I get a pension and uh, my wife's happy because she knows when I'm going to come home and I don't right. have to go away and it's not actually so bad. I don't mind the work. So I'm, I'm thinking of knocking music on the head and everyone's like, nah, don't worry about it. You know, when it comes back, you'll be the first to be gigging. And uh, then the next thing is them posting up on Facebook, you know, 11 guitars for sale, seven amps, you know, you're thinking, wow, you really are knocking this. So it's, it's, um, it's made a lot of people rethink a lot of stuff. Um, initially for me, mm-hmm. uh, I, I didn't, I didn't, I, I was, I was working a lot. I was doing a show in, in the West End uh, of an evening and I was recording a fair amount during the day uh, mm-hmm. and then I was taking time off the show to do tours and, and gigs and stuff. And I, I hadn't had a day off for a long, long time. Um, and, and, and that sounds silly. Uh, why would you complain about that? And I would never complain about that only for the fact that when it all stopped, I was like, wow, I, I, I was getting really burned out. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, wasn't, I was just taking everything on and wasn't stopping to smell the roses. And, um, mm-hmm. I didn't actually touch the drums for about three and a half, four weeks. Um, and then I went in to go and play. I think, I, I think I mentioned this to you like over the phone when we just caught up one day. I went in to go and play and um, I, I it obviously didn't feel very good because I hadn't touched the drums in a month. Um, and mentally I was just like, none of this is sounding very good. I need to work at this harder. And I was in there for a couple of hours, a really frustrating couple of hours. It was horrible. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, well, I'll knock this on the head. I'll come back tomorrow. I'll just try again. I went back the next day and I hated it. I was like, nothing I'm doing is coming off. And even the stuff I can do is awful. I was playing along to music. I was working on stuff from books, everything. And nothing felt good or sounded good. But moreover, it often doesn't when you're practicing, right? That's the point. Mm-hmm. I just was, wasn't enjoying a second of it. I was like, I don't know if I missed this. 
Um, and then I started to get all these weird feelings like, am I giving up the drums? This is yeah. really and I definitely wasn't, you know, I was listening to music all day, every day. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was this really weird disconnect. And then somebody asked me, you know, when people started finding their feet about a month or two into lockdown, it was different here, I guess, than in the States and most other places, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But in, in London, there, it was, there was a lockdown, as in, I think, March 22nd, something like that last year. You were right. allowed to one hour a day. Wow. So you could go out for an hour exercise. Mm -hmm. was a kind of thing. Um, and you could meet one person. If you were a solo occupant in your house, you could meet one other person. I forget. It was one other person to go on a walk or something. So nobody was seeing anybody. Um, you know, I had friends who had girlfriends on the other side of town and weren't allowed to see them, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then about a month in, somebody said, oh, can you, uh, you know, I, the last four weeks I've been working on my own stuff. Can you play some drums on it? And I've got a recording set up in my, in my room. And um, I was like, okay. And I went in and because it was for purpose, mm -hmm. I absolutely loved it. And my sort of worry was immediately dispelled. Um, the fact that because it was for something, it wasn't just going in thinking I should probably play drums because I haven't done it in a while. Right. Um, because it was for purpose, I really enjoyed it. And that sort of flipped the switch. But there was a worrying four weeks there where right. I was like, I don't even know if I missed this. And it was partly due to the fact that I was so burned out by having done so much in the run up to the lockdown and, uh, and it not being for purpose, just going into noodle for the sake of it. Um, yeah, and then as soon as stuff started rolling in, I was like, okay, I feel better about this now. Absolutely, I think I think there was a time period where, we, like you said, people trying to get their feet back underneath them, and how is this new situation going to work? You know, and I similarly, right when the start of lockdown happened, we in the states it was like, stay home for two weeks, we'll flatten the curve, and then we'll be able to get back to life, and that's that's what we thought. Two weeks. Um, and I remember thinking, okay, that's okay. I can, I can stay home for two weeks. And, and, you know, I hadn't really thought about not traveling or any of that, but let's just be home and um, take a break for a minute. And then as it started dragging on, I think it was really, really hard. You know, although I'm not a touring musician, 90% of my friends are touring musicians. And so the phone calls and the worry um, about the future and about gigs and about making a living and family and all of that, it was it was really, really tough, really heartbreaking. And, um, you know, just, just worry for friends, worry for family, worry for myself. And I felt like that was all, it all led to a lot of like inaction, like you were saying, sitting down at the drums and just not feeling like a creative entity, not yeah. feeling like making music. Um, it, sorry, no, I was gonna say it took a while uh, for myself and for other friends who I've spoken to, 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 to take the pressure off themselves. Mm -hmm. You, you put a lot of pressure on yourself and there's all this stuff like there were these memes and this sort of rubbish influencer stuff on social media and all the rest. Of it. I took a long break from it and I, I, I loved it. Mm -hmm. um, all saying stuff like, you know, or well, if you don't at least learn a language in this lockdown, you know, you've wasted your time. This is a chance to be something great. And I was just like, how about you just relax? And you know, it's weird. Everybody's navigating this thing. It's the first time in modern humanity that something on this scale, certainly globally has happened. Mm -hmm same boat just it's going to take everybody some time but my one of my best friends um he's married to her now but i'll never forget he he met his wife who was a, uh, a psychotherapist and the first time i ever met her we went for a meal and she was like oh you're mark the drummer right and i was like yeah and she said well what do you what else do you do and i was like um well i play the drums you know it's my hobby she goes, yeah. Yeah, it's job i was like yeah and she goes, but what, but what do you do when you're not playing the drums? I was like, well, I, I don't know. Like, she goes, well, what happened if you weren't able to play drums? You know, what, what do you do in your life? And I was like, well, this is a bit deep. I've just met you. You're marrying my friend. Aren't, we supposed, aren't you supposed to be like, <laughs> you know, buttering me up or something? I don't know. But it just felt a bit weird. And anyway, she was, I was like, this is weird. Um, I, I don't know. I don't really do much other than play drums. Mm -hmm. And she was like, hey, when you go on holiday. I said, I kind of read a lot because everybody reads a lot on holiday or watches movies or whatever on the beach, you know, on their iPad or, or their Kindle. What, what do you do to relax? Like other than that, I was like, well, I like scuba diving. You know, I do that sometimes. She goes, well, right, do more of that. 
I was like, yeah, okay. So I drove home thinking this was a really weird thing. And, um, and then I, I really got into scuba diving in a big way. I do a lot of that now and sort of extreme cave diving, like mm-hmm. 80 meters in caves for six and a half hours. It's really weird diving. But it was more to make the point that she, she made me realize that I identify myself, and I think all musicians do, as their instrument and their mm-hmm. love and passion for music. So point in case, she called me Mark the drummer. You know, mm-hmm. I go to a network of friends and, you know, if it's scuba friends or if it's, you know, different friends or water friends or, or, or sports friends, it's like, oh, Mark the drummer's coming later. Oh, which Mark? You know, Mark the drummer, you know. Mm-hmm. It's how you identify yourself. It's how you make your living. It's how you know. And so when people... So when people were faced with this crisis, not only not able to make money for their families, as you say, and doing touring and doing all this other stuff, but, you know, personally, like, I'm, I'm Mark the drummer and I'm not drumming, so what the hell am I? You know, like, this right. is, not only am I not able to provide my family, uh, but, you know, like, what even am I anymore if I can't do that thing? Maybe never be able, you know, there was one stage where we were like, is it ever going to come back in the same way? Right. Uh, and so I completely understand what you were saying about, you know, your friends on the phone worried. Like it was not only career wise, but existentially, you know, like. Absolutely. Like what is my identity, right? If that, if your name is, is followed by that tag, that tagline, then, yeah. and that's not there anymore. What is your identity? I all, I similarly went through something, you know, last summer where I was very, very um, attached to a brand and, and that's what I was known for. And then I thought, well, when that's not there, where is my identity? Where does that lie? And I think that situations like this kind of push you to redefine yourself. So I, you know, have, have, have redefined myself in a way and you have redefined yourself. And I know that ultimately you are Mark the drummer. That is your passion and your love. And we're going to talk a lot about the music part of it. But you also have all these other things happening in your life. So you have all of these other, you know, taglines, mark the ex- extreme diver. Um, and we talk about <laughs> talk about diving for a minute because I've, you know, we, we've talked about diving for years. I also love scuba diving. Um, a lot of people go scuba, scuba diving and they see the nature under the sea and they are, you know, really like changed by being under the ocean and that environment, which is so um, solitary in a way where you're just cut off from the rest of the world. You don't hear the world happening. You're just underneath the ocean with all of these incredible beings. And it's it's a beautiful experience. Um, so my experience is scuba diving, seeing sea turtles and fish and all of those wonderful things. And then we talk about your scuba diving. And like you said, it's extreme, like six hours through a cave. And I feel like you are um, challenging yourself with these things and challenging your body and your mental state because mentally to be underwater in a cave for six hours straight, like finding your way through. And sometimes you're in the dark and you show me some pictures and I thought, oh my goodness, this is, this is serious. So <laughs> how did you get into that? Well, I, I, I was diving for a, for a while, for quite a while, and um, my my uh, one of the guys who taught me was like, you should get into technical diving. You know, you've got the aptitude for it, and uh, it looks like you'd 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 really enjoy it. So decompression diving. So m- most mm-hmm. scuba diving, when you go on holiday, you go up to sort of thirty meters, maybe forty meters, um, but for a tiny amount of time because then you have to get to the top. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to do it slow enough that basically imagine. Uh, like when you open a can of Coke on an airplane and all the bubbles have expanded because it's under pressure and it fizzes everywhere. So when you go down, all the bubbles, you've got tiny little micro, uh, micro bubbles of nitrogen in, in your blood system going around. And as you go down, they compress and they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then as you come up, they get bigger. Now your body's pretty good at getting rid of these bubbles, but if you come up too quickly and they get too big too quickly, one of those bubbles gets lodged in an artery and it goes to your heart and you have a heart attack or a your brain and you have a stroke and all this stuff it's called the bends or get stuck uh, somewhere around your body so decompression diving is where you do much deeper dives but come up really slowly over a much longer period of time you're on different gases and things like that and i was interested and in, i spoke to one of my friends and he told me a story about how he was in um 
it's kind of like the final frontier. There's so much of this planet that we haven't seen on our planet. And I get space exploration. I get all that. But um, mm -hmm. like uh, he, he told me a story about how he was a safety diver for some of the National Geographic team. Uh, and they'd just done the cenotes caves in uh, near Tulum in Mexico, and they were going on this other dive. And he rang me up. He skyped me from um, from Mexico. Going, Mate, you'll never believe what's happened to me today. I was like, What happened to you? And he goes, Well, we did this dive down in this cave, and it was it was only two hours down, and then we had to spend like three hours coming up. And I was like, Okay, that's kind of still intense, you know? That's pretty. This five hour dive. Yeah, but man, that's not it. When we were down there, we saw that this this cave opened up into this big room that was like, you know. 15 meters by 30 meters it was huge and on it there was this ledge and on this ledge um there was a skeleton of a bird and they were all freaking out and i couldn't believe it and then i didn't know why they were just writing on their slates like exclamation marks and wow 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 and so anyway we finished the dive and i, I was like what's going on what why were you so excited and they previously thought that this bird because of the way its wings they'd got skeletons of this bird and the way its wings had had looked in fossils and skeletons that they'd found was a flightless bird but they would found it on a ledge in a nest so it must have been able to fly to get up there so he was part of this great discovery about this genus of bird or, or this species of birds um that they finally found out that they could fly because they'd been able wow. to do this thing and i was like i'm in how do i do that that sounds great <laughs> and so he taught me he, he took me through all the all the um qualifications and uh i'd previously done some stuff with my friend uh, Medi, who taught me a load of stuff and is a fantastic diver and i thought i just want to take this a little bit further and you know just see stuff that maybe six people in the world have ever seen it's yes it's, it's you know i still love yes. fish though i, I love going on holiday. Yes. <laughs> love going on. like that's the, all the important stuff lives in the first 18 meters so if you want to mm -hmm. see you know, sharks maybe a bit deeper but you want to see jellyfish and Right, the pretty, the pretty stuff. You pretty you go stuff, deep and you yeah. see like the yeah. creatures of the deep, but yeah. <laughs> that's it is. one thing doesn't mean you can't enjoy the other. I love them sort of equally. I Absolutely. Like and the discipline it takes, you know. There's a there's a saying like in the cave diving world: if if something goes wrong, you've got the rest of your life to figure it out. Um, which could be the next fifty seconds. Who knows? You know. Right. But the pressure that's in that situation. I I love it, and I I really enjoy being like okay this is this is a problem let's try and figure this out straight away instead That's of so great. Oh my god, oh my god, you know it's right just, yeah. yeah you have to be calm you have to be calm in those moments but that's really incredible i think i think they say that the same thing about um skydiving right if something goes wrong you have the rest of your life to figure it out exactly right yeah yeah <laughs> you're probably right except you're, you're plummeting faster you know it's that's, yeah. that's a really awful way to to try and figure something out right? yes well, yeah it, splat We'll just stick to diving. It's good. Yeah, for the time being. Um, but so, and then another thing too that kept you really busy through the pandemic, besides diving, like diving and exploring and all of that. But before the pandemic, you had joined the RNLI as a volunteer, right? And then the pandemic started, and you had time, so you were working more with them. And for anyone who doesn't know what that is, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Tell us about that because also I did see a picture of you as a kid, like in the gear. So this is something that was like in your mind or part of your life or a possibility as you were growing up. Yeah. So um, we we are Londoners, uh, sort of born and raised for the most part, but we spent about eight or ten years, roughly, down in Devon on the coast uh, in the southwest mm -hmm. uh, in a place called Exmouth, and. Um, there was a lifeboat station there. We lived a mile away or so from the lifeboat station, and we used to go down to their open days and watch them launch. And you know, I was a little kid, and they used to let me wear the gear. And um, I loved it. I loved the idea that these guys would literally drop everything and go out to sea and and, and try to help uh, someone. You know, uh, and so I I donated when I was a kid. I donated some of my pocket money, and I was part of something called their Storm Force. So I used to get their newsletters. And then when I was much older, I um. Uh, you know, and I, 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 I joined the crew at Chiswick, um, like three, three and a half years ago, I went down there and I've been fundraising for years for them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, about two and a half, maybe three years ago now, I, I went down and spoke to a chap with Glenn at the station and said, you know, do you need any crew? Because there's, there's stations on the Thames. Mm -hmm. um, 
I live just right on the Thames River, and um, it's the, the, our two lifeboat stations on the Thames. Well, there are three or four, but there are three full-time ones, and us and a, and one in the very centre of London, in central London called Tower, we're the two busiest stations in, in the country and in, in Europe. Um, and uh, they were like, yeah, we always need sort of good people. And um, so for about, for quite a while, I was joining and being a volunteer and in between gigs and um, and stuff, you know, I gave, was giving up my time to go and do that. And then of course the, the coronavirus hit and I was in, um, I was in the station actually so me and, it was a weird thing it was there was over two days me and my friend jacob uh, went out for a sunday lunch and um and he would he would get a call and he'd go oh right okay well thanks mate oh and he'd put the phone down i go was that a cancellation he'd go yeah and then i oh, sorry and i'd get a call and be like oh right those gigs are off okay and we were just watching the world get cancelled in front mm -hmm. of us and i was in the station in, doing a shift at the lifeboat when uh, my last gig the show i was doing were like we're not coming back, uh, and it was all cancelled. And I looked at I looked at my friend Andy, who's who's uh, who's taught me so much of, of that stuff, um, and said, "You know, I think that's my job gone." Mm -hmm. like, well, don't worry, mate. You know, just come come here more. Um, and so it ended up being a part time job. You know, like four days a week. Sometimes I was there for forty eight hours because you do a twelve hour shift. So, um, yeah, providing this cover and uh, and just and and uh, and. You know, like I say, it's the busiest, the two busiest lifeboat stations in the country. So, we right, were the whole time, and because of coronavirus and people isolating and stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, far fewer crew. So it was just as well that it, this had happened at that time, and I was able to sort of help out. Um, that is amazing, and and I know that you know you're probably grateful for something to keep you busy, keep you yeah. keep you moving, and um, and it seems like a very very busy. Just following you and. Um, you know, what, ha what's happening. It seems like it's a very busy job with people like falling in the Thames and jumping into the Thames and, you know, you're, you're constantly pulling people out and, and not just people, but, but animals. Um, and <laughs> there's a fantastic video yeah. of you saving a cat who, yeah. who wasn't so happy because cats are, you know, even when you're helping a cat, sometimes it's not that grateful. So sorry that's that's my rabbit that's not a cat that's my rabbit oh yes oh my goodness your rabbit it's ignoring but yeah there was there was a cat as well like the the reality the reality is people a lot of people go there's there's been a massive rise as i'm sure you can imagine in, in, in problems of mental health mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people you know throwing themselves off bridges and trying to do themselves harm in the water that sort of thing but one of the main or a lot of a lot of calls we get are people who go in after animals, after their dogs. It's a residential area, London, really. So people go for a dog walk by the Thames with their, mm -hmm. with their dog. And, uh, the dog falls in, and they think, "Oh my God, a dog! I've, I've got to go in and jump in after it." And then the dog self recovers and jumps out and swims away, and then the human's in trouble. And there have been some really nasty incidents. People people die all, all the time uh, from getting in trouble uh, mm -hmm. because they have to help something. It, it, you know, not being heroic, but it's you know, in their best interest, in, in their best nature to want to try and help. And uh, they jump in and we end up recovering them and the dog is on the, on the side thing. And right. they, this, there was this one cat who was, um, who at first really didn't want to be helped, <laughs> really didn't want to be helped. But I think after he started drowning, he, drowning, he, uh, he kind of got the gist that he was, yeah, he was like, this guy's my only way out. Right, exactly, yes. I think you even you made it onto uh, to television with that one, so that yeah, was so that was pretty good. And I have to say, watch um, the the CCTV. You know, there's uh, it's interesting in London. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot a lot of CCTV cameras as well around the states, but um, I think in London it's very very like highly controlled between you all and the helicopters and the people like dispatch watching and monitoring, and that's fascinating to me that that's how it all works and so so you have to work with the uh, mpas which is the metropolitan police air service and uh, the marine police and uh, london ambulance service and the mm -hmm. fire service and us. it's all part it's all a big team it's not it's not it's nobody there's nobody being heroic it's just loads of really well-trained people coming together to, to to hopefully 
you know, help people out. And right, right. And that, and it's amazing. So thank you for for giving back to um, to your community and for everything that you're doing with that. It's incredible. And so so that's what kept you busy through the pandemic, besides doing a lot of, um, you know, recording, remote recording and all of that fun stuff. But I'm so excited. I, you know, we talked a few months ago about what you had coming up and we couldn't record this podcast because it was under wraps for the moment, but now we can talk about it a little bit about what you have been up to, the exciting things going on music wise. And every single time I see you post, I get so happy, like live music is happening. Um, you are back playing with Ed Sheeran, which is so exciting. And you have been doing a lot of stuff. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I mean, I've been, uh... It's, I've been really lucky, and I and I, I I know that there are people who are who are still really struggling, and it's gonna it's gonna be a struggle for a while longer, for, you know, for everyone, for everyone, mm -hmm. regardless of what they post. And this is part of the problem with the social media. Somebody posts a picture of drum kit, and you go, hang on a minute, why are they working? And you know, it's not every day. And don't believe everything you read on social media, kids. It's poison. But it's really nice that there are green shoots, and slowly but surely, people are coming back to work. It's starting. Mm -hmm. It's it's um, I've, I've been I've been with Ed for about ten or eleven years now. My friend Chris uh, Leonard, who's a fantastic guitarist, introduced me to Ed years ago, and um, we did a live lounge in I think February twenty ten or twenty eleven, something like that. Um, and I've been with him ever since. Now he doesn't tour with a band usually. I mean mm -hmm. he, uh, he it's worth checking out his live stuff. He, he uses his loop station, this specially built thing he calls chewy two um which is a, a really elaborate loop station so he plays a bit of drums on his guitar then plays a bit of rhythm and then beatboxes or whatever else and then plays the song over the top of that um but over the last 10 years or so when there's been promo there have been sort of jules holland tv shows and there have been um you know late night sort of talk shows and things like that where you've got three minutes 30 seconds to showcase your song as it sounds for the audience and that's that, you know, you don't have the time to build up this loop stuff and people want people want to hear it like they're going to buy it or like they're going to hear it on the radio. Mm -hmm. So like, promo appearances and, and for a fair amount of them, I mean, we were doing four in a day, for, you know, occasionally, and we were doing them over three or four months in the release of a new album or a new song. Um, there'd, there'd be a fair amount of work. And then thankfully, you know, Ed's, Ed's a brilliant guy and he's had dad, he's a dad now. Mm -hmm. and he's a productive lockdown because he's uh, he's managed to spend time with his brand new baby and his wife and um, and and work on this new stuff and it's it looks like now that we're easing out there's more and more little bits happening but um, just just grateful for every call you know you get saying oh you're out to this you're out to that we've got promo to do or there's this recording thingy or we're doing a show here or a show there. Mm -hmm. Super grateful for for the um, opportunity to, to to work, given you know the situation that. Absolutely, in. yeah. Then you and you just did a um, it was a live live stream TikTok show. Is that right? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was it was bonkers. It was for the UEFA. Right, work this out. It was for the 2020 uh, UEFA Championships, so the European Football Championships. They're still calling it the 2020, even though it's 2021, because obviously right. you know it didn't happen last year. And there's uh, England are playing tomorrow night, by the way, we're filming this on a Tuesday and they're playing on a Wednesday. So my mood might be slightly different tomorrow night when <laughs> we get through it. Um, but yeah, so so it was it was for TikTok um, and it was at Ipswich Stadium. So it was at a, a football stadium. Mm -hmm. But of course, there was nobody there. Right. Um, so TikTok did this really cool thing of... Um, augmented reality so we'd be playing and you can't see any of this and obviously it's a live stream but they do a replay uh later on that day and then the next day and you're sort of looking at it going like in a song he does called bloodstream they made the pitch which of course nobody was on because nobody was in the venue look like streams of blood and you know wow. these pictures all over the place and it was this augmented reality thing and it looked absolutely incredible on 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 the replay on the app um and, and we all got there, and obviously we're, we're at the stadium with this, it's, it's tons and tons of space. Mm -hmm. and, um, we're all in a thin strip. So, like, there's Ed, and then I'm just to his his right, and just above him, and 
you know, there's four of us next to him and one on either side and then two below him. And it's like, why aren't we all just in a band, a line, like a band, you know, like on a gig? And then, of course, when people are watching it on their phones, on TikTok, it's got this really thin kind of portrait vibe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's how they set up the stage. And it, on, on camera, it looked absolutely sensational. It looked that's ridiculous. really cool. Yeah, it did it, it like in terms of numbers. I hear it did you know incredibly well, incredibly well for it, which is which is fantastic. It's, it's I'm amazing. sure, I'm sure, and it, it is pretty amazing how technology has kind of like come to the rescue in a lot of ways. And you know, we we yeah. the social media thing. You know, we we joke about that and how it's it's good to take breaks from that and not take it too seriously. But it is pretty amazing how technology has kind of like come to the rescue. Technology allowed us all to see each other through this whole thing. I mean, I feel more connected in a lot of ways to um, to a lot of people because we took the time to like FaceTime and call and, you know, see each other on Zoom calls and um, and check in with each other. And then the whole like live stream thing has just been amazing. And I, I see that, like you just said, it was incredible how they did the, the, um, graphics and all of that stuff for that. I, I see that continuing for sure in a lot of ways that brings the concerts to people who might not have had a chance to see it, right? And experience that. Um, and I know I personally can't wait to get out to some live shows, but it, it's, been, it's been pretty great. And I see it continuing and you know the technology advancing for sure. Um, I mean, the, the technology has, has really helped, uh, you know, me make a living as well as as, mm-hmm. as a lot of drummers who are able to record from their studios or their practice spaces or whatever, whatever they've got you know um and now with technology you know you can put plugins on onto the to the raw audio and make it sound like it was recorded at Abbey road or air or all the rest of it and whilst it might not be completely perfect when it's buried in a mix you know i mean people listening to this music the end user we, we, we take for granted that, that we've all got finely tuned ears because it's our job and it's part of a pride in what mm-hmm. you do an audiologist about these things and be a bit of a geek. But really the end user, the kid that's listening to this in their iPhone on a bus, you know, doesn't care if it wasn't recorded at Abbey Road. It could have been in, you know, Johnny Bagger Donut Studio down the road with a, with a plug-in that makes it a bit reverby. And, you know, so all this technology has helped all of us, you know, feel our way through it and get right. back. I'm a better audio engineer now than I was at the beginning of this, just by virtue of necessity. You know, I've had to, I've had to get better at this stuff because I've recorded something and then, yeah, it was great. It was good. That was good performance. Okay, cool. I'll edit this up. You know, mm-hmm. uh, ends ready to send. And oh, hang on a minute. It sounds there's a bit of a weird flutter on that bass drum because of the yeah. root. And it's so you get better and you re-record it and you, you right. Know, it's, it's sort of a baptism of fire sometimes. If somebody goes, you know, early on in the the pandemics, the lockdowns. Um, you know, oh, I, I want to release this on Monday. You know, can you get drums on it? You're like, yeah, sure. And then you go in. And you're like, Hang on, this isn't as easy. I see these guys do this every day of the week. You know, set up these mics and they have it done in 15 minutes. And they're, you know, think, yeah, that's good. That's good distance. Great, cool. Right. And then you think, oh, it's easy. I, I, I see that enough that I know how to do it. But the reality is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an art in and of itself. And it is. It makes uh, you appreciate, uh, you know, yeah. that, the, you know, the people who have that experience that has been only gained over time doing that over and over and over again um, mm-hmm. and honing that experience. I think it makes you appreciate all of those people. I oh, yeah. similarly, you know, have so much more appreciation for so many uh, things, so many people who do things that I've had to also do myself through this time period. And um it's amazing. It's so and, amazing. And and after, you know, a husband and two kids as well. You know. You know. <laughs> it's not, it's, but it isn't. It's genuinely. It's something weird that. And again, I know it's different for folks in the US than, than, than it is perhaps in the UK, and maybe not in some cases. But it's like you, you know, oh, you can't go out. You can't do this. You can't do that. You know, there, there, there's a, there's somebody living in Tower Hamlets in in a tower block. You know, with with four kids, a husband and wife in a two bed flat. And their playground at the bottom of the uh, the bottom of their yard is all shut off because of coronavirus restrictions. Mm. What are you going to do mm-hmm. every day for a year with those kids? You know, when there's no schools, there's no this, there's that. So, so, so a lot of people have had it a lot worse than you know. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's been yeah, really and and I think everyone has their own challenges through this whole thing too. You know, it's um, 
having to, we just talked about having to become your own audio engineer, like that kind of thing. But then having to also change your personal life a lot, like it's definitely, it's definitely put a lot of things, I say this all the time, into perspective. Um, it has, it's yeah. made you kind of rethink. And we, you were saying earlier, we both have a lot of friends who have changed their careers and, um, and for, for a lot of them, it, it's a better situation for them now, or maybe they are doing what they want to do at the moment. Um, for some people, it feels like we're all hoping they get back to doing what we love hearing them, them do. And, um, you know, speaking of you and getting back into music and back into playing and what your number one passion is, although you have all these other things going on, like that's your core, that's your, that's what you identify as at the top. And, uh, you know, just to talk about some of the artists that you've played with, you've had an amazing, you know, recording and performing roster of artists that you play with just to to name a few, um, Ollie Murs and Leona Lewis, besides Ed Sheeran, Tom Jones, um, a whole a whole lot of really fantastic musicians. You've done tons of TV stuff and you were mentioning the show that you were doing and it's just, um, it's amazing. Your career has been amazing. And I'm so happy that it's things are opening back up. Opportunities are opening back up and, you know, you're getting back out there and you're playing. And even if it's live stream or it's on TikTok or wherever it is that you're making. You, know, music. you, you just, you, you, you know, you take, and I was saying to you before we came on out, it's like, it's, uh, I'm, 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 I'm really grateful for, for, for having had the opportunity to play with some really fantastic people and people like, you know, um, we we won an Oscar f for a song that we played with Elton John on on his on his movie, and mm -hmm. uh, and and it was um, like you you try telling a thirteen year old me in a room like yeah you know you'll be on a song that wins an Oscar it's great right it's, it's absolutely insane you know so so grateful um, but but as I was saying to you before before we uh, came came on the air uh, just a, just a while ago. I, I think of it, uh, and and this is going to sound ridiculous, like a like I'm a plumber, like um, n not know your place, but understand your role. You know, it's a blue collar job. You turn up, not looking like an idiot. So, and that could be anything. You know, if it's a grunge band, you don't turn up in a suit and tie. If it's, mm -hmm. I remember Steve White telling me a story about a guy who turned up. He needed somebody to sit in. I think I might be telling this story wrong. He needed somebody to sit on on a Paul Weller audition. Or, or, or a Paul Weller gig and he came into audition and you know he opened up his cymbal bag this guy to get ready to, to play and a splash cymbal rolled out of his case across the floor and Paul Weller turned to Steve and said not him <laughs> do you know what I mean like you, you get yes. you, get ready, you get ready for the role I'm probably doing that story of Miss Justice or it's a mix of no, several but the message the message is understood for sure the right thing and, and that's so it's a blue collar job you turn up you know, maybe looking the part, and I struggle with that sometimes. I'm wearing a jumper I've been wearing all lockdown. Um, you know, you turn up knowing the stuff, you turn up with the ability to execute the stuff well, you're not a complete pain in the ass, and 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 that's kind of it, you know. Like, it's a blue collar job, it's like a, a plumber, you know, you go around and you fix someone's U bend, and if you do a great job, well, when they need their shower done, they'll probably call you back. It's, it's the same deal, you know. Mm -hmm. it's like, a good job and keep your head down and play and play well. I mean, that's a given. You have to be able to play. Um, then the rest is, you know, they'll 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 call you back or they'll go, oh, you should use this guy. He was great on our thing, or you know. And it just it just happens like that. So it's um, I've been incredibly lucky for the opportunities I've had. Absolutely, but but also it, it is it isn't. You know, it's. It's the same as everybody who's gigging in, in, in their pub, you know, or, or wherever. Those people mm -hmm. get just as much enjoyment out of listening to your creativity and your music and your playing of drums than any anything else. It's not you know, just having a having a gig that just just by virtue of it being fam a famous person doesn't mean it's worth any more than anyone else's gig. It's it's the playing and it's the creativity and, and the life experience you get from playing with other musicians and all the rest of it. So absolutely any of the opportunities i've been given it's just to sort of say that's not the be all and end all you know i'll still have fun if i'm not playing yeah. 
this is incredible people. One yes, yeah, and and I, that's a really great perspective, and a and a really good message too for other drummers out there who are looking to, you know, do get into drumming full time or have that be their main their main gig. Your place in this industry is so important, and the kind of drummer that you are, where you get the call back because you do such a great job, and you know, you talk about it, likening it to being a plumber. You show up and you replace the U bend, but if you're a drum, if you're a plumber who shows up and you know puts a, a straight pipe in where the U bend goes, bad news, right? You're not going to get the call back. So you know, if you're noodling all over everything, it's yeah. like, you know, replace your new your, your U bend. But I also did a number on your shower as well. Why are you not <laughs> showering much? You know, leave that. You know, <laughs> you know, know what you need to bring to the party, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and do it really well. I mean, that's a given. Nobody, you know, that there's an assumption that. That, that's not an assumption. You should be able to do it really, really well. That's a given. Mm -hmm. But the other bits that people don't teach you, and sometimes you have to learn the hard way, which I've sure done in the past. You know, like I, I, my first ever thing, I joined a band when I was at school, and I came up to, um, we came up to a big studio, and it was, it was amazing, and it was all great, and uh, and I, I, I wasn't ready. I absolutely wasn't ready. I screwed everything up from start to finish. I was overplaying. My sound wasn't right. It was wonky, the time was out, you know, I was 17 years old and I could play along to Master Plan by Dave Wackel, sort of. <laughs> so I thought I had it all laid out and I said, I could kill this studio job, you know, it's amazing. It's a band and they're, and they're gonna call me for everything, it's gonna be great. And uh, I went to go and collect my drums three days later and they were all in the cases upside down as if somebody else had come in and played them, which I found out three months later, they obviously had, because it was nothing like what I'd done when the record came out. Oh. Phoned them up and asked them about it, and they were like, "Yeah, it didn't really work out, did it?" So we had to, you know, this other guy came. It was heartbroken. That is but heartbreaking. What a great lesson, right? Great lesson, like, well, tell me what I did. What did I do wrong? And they're like, mm -hmm. "Oh, it's just a bit wonky. It was all over the place." Have a listen to what the guy played in the end. I was like, "I can play that, yeah," but you didn't. But you didn't, yeah. And that was a huge, huge lesson, and and it was a a big attitude change and a whole bunch of other stuff that really needed to happen. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those lessons are really hard. Sometimes they're obvious and you hope you won't have to learn them the hard way. Sometimes they're not, but um, yeah, just, just, you know, showing up, being prepared to do the job, being over, so over prepared that nothing could possibly go wrong, even if it did. Um, Gavin Harrison talks about the CPU thing, you know, having like a computer mm -hmm. and, or a car. I, I talk about it like a car, you know, if your car can go 200 miles an hour and you're on the motorway or the freeway and something goes wrong, well, you're able to accelerate out of trouble. And if you're going 70 miles an hour, then it's not really a big deal. It's not hard work. But if you're in a car that can go 80 miles an hour and you're going 75 miles an hour along the motorway, then you're at your capacity. If anything goes wrong, if anything changes or you need to speed up to get out of trouble or slow down quickly, your car can't do it. Your brain can't do it. You're mm. you. So you should always be over prepared in the event that if anything comes your way, it's easily navigable. You know, it's I love not, that. Yeah, it's not like, oh god, I'm already, I'm already at my absolute limit of being able to play. Where, and they want me to do a what? They want me to go faster. You know, so right? Being over prepared can never, can never really be a bad thing. In my life. That is fantastic advice. Absolutely fantastic. And I picture you. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine you being underprepared for anything. I picture you as like always prepared. And I remember, I were you, were you? Yeah, you okay. yeah I was, yeah. That makes sense. It makes so much sense. I, I remember um, coming to London and you are a fantastic tour guide, by the way. Um, oh. If you ever, if you ever want like a fifth career on top of everything else you could you could be a tour guide uh, but I remember you coming and you were you were going to give a tour around London and you came to the hotel that I was staying at and you not only had like a bag of snacks which is amazing you had like a bag of snacks and drinks I think you had like a sweater just in case it got cold you know like there, there was an umbrella it was like a you know you could just pull anything I think out of this bag for any <laughs> situations <laughs> Welcome to you need an umbrella. I picture you, I just picture you always being prepared for everything. And, and I appreciate that about you too. Cause I think we did need snacks that day. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, 
it's it's but it's true it's it's but it can it's for any any you know if you're if you're a great musician and that's all very you know very cool and fancy if you if you had a kid and your kid was about to start his day as a tour guide and he was walking out of the door completely unprepared you'd be like oh you do know the name of that place right and so mm -hmm. when they ask, you can tell them what it is and and maybe go the extra mile and find out some facts about that building or you know so you could go and work with a new artist it's like find out who they're into mm. so, well yeah okay the reason why they're the reason why their music sounds this way is because they're really into Joni Mitchell um and so maybe listen to some Joni Mitchell so you can get into the headspace of of what they want to hear maybe from from their accompanying musicians mm -hmm. or um maybe maybe just go the extra mile do a bit more homework so that when nobody's going to shout at you for being over prepared i mean i can't i can't believe you know this stuff like the back of your hand it's ridiculous mm -hmm. maybe write the lyrics <laughs> down when some when a singer songwriter invites you to a session or, or whatever or, or, or says can you put some drums on my, on my stuff i write the lyrics down because that's where the sentiment is. That's what that's what they're trying to say, right? You know, mm -hmm. oh, this this guy's a, a piece of a piece of work. You know, he just he's cheating on this girl, and now this girl's really sad, and she's in her room because you know, and then her, her dad left, and it's all this stuff, you know, and and you can get inside it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I know what this needs, but you know, it's 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 that that extra mile is kind of what the art lies in the detail, I think. That's Absolutely. Definitely. Yes. And I'm sure, I'm sure that the musician that you're playing for appreciates that so much because they have poured their heart and soul into this music that they're writing. I think about Ed as a good example um, because his music has kind of like changed with his life and you hear him write about all the stages in his life when, you know, when Ed kind of first broke onto the scene, the things that he was writing about are different than the things he's writing about now, you know, Absolutely. his family yeah. and all of that so you have to kind of get into that headspace too and feel that music in order to bring to it the the best emotion that you can through the drums which i'm sure is so appreciated by the musicians that you play with that's it and, and just be a bit sensitive to what they need i did um i did a like one of the first recording things i i did um uh, this month was a couple a couple of days ago at core just down the road from from where i live in west london um, and it was a, a young female singer songwriter who was doing her debut album and she'd got a friend that I, I work with a lot of producer I work with a lot to produce her stuff up and um, She was like, oh I, this this thing. I, I you know, I, it's really It's really quiet. I don't know really what to do there. It's kind of I just want some drums on it But I want it kind of like oh, I don't know yellow and people would be like, okay, what fruitcake yellow? Really? Mm -hmm. what does yellow mean? But if you think about it if you try and get into their headspace Yellow, what's yellow? It's bright. So no sort of dark, dull, earthy mm. tones. No, they don't mm -hmm. want rock like toms, that's for sure. Maybe something light and fluffy and airy, like brushy. Happy, right. Something, and happy stuff. Yeah. Nothing, too, nothing too rumbly and intense. So, you know, you can get a lot just by being fairly sensitive to what people are after, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, into listening to their language and understanding their, understanding their language. You know, you interpreting what she meant by that is so incredibly important. Um, and it just brings me back to the cymbal days, you know, choosing choosing cymbal sounds and hearing, you know, someone ask for a color um, or for a word that you'd never heard describing a cymbal before and you have to decipher that. So um, I understand exactly what you're saying. And I don't know that there's anybody, anybody better in the world than you and Tina uh, Clark, formerly, of, uh, formerly of, of Zildjian UK at that job, you know, people sort of <laughs> emailing who some incredibly descriptive and highly detailed and I want this and I want dark and I want the bow to sound like this and the bell to be like this and I want this decay and this this overtone. Mm. Like, uh, I need some symbols for my rock band. <laughs> you know, they didn't know any, didn't know, weren't geeks about the instrument um, and, and, and you guys nailing it every time. So, so it's much the same thing, you know, just being sensitive to people's language and like, mm -hmm. okay, let's find out. It's exactly the same thing you know if you're a, a interior designer or anything and somebody comes to you an architect and somebody comes to you and goes uh, yeah i want the place like airy well okay well i'm not gonna put no windows in then i'm gonna put, you know you're sensitive and you're trying to build for, for me what has always given me the biggest kick is trying to make someone's 
dream, I don't know how to say this, that being cheesy, someone's, what, what's in their head become reality. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, you know, this, this young singer songwriter is going to get a bite of the apple and they might get a, a chance. And yeah. uh, it's their one chance and they're in a studio and there's all these people doing work for them and you want it to be amazing for them. Mm. That was you. And that again, someday will be you, you know, wanting somebody to do something for you that's great and elevates your performance. And, and that's yes. what gives me a kick is, is having somebody turn around and go, that's it. That's what I, oh my God, how did you get, you know, it's like, well, you know, a bit of experience, obviously, but just sort of listening and forming mm -hmm. what around what you've asked for, you know. Yeah, and experience too. You know, the more that you do that, the more you can trust your intuition and your feel for it and all of that. And and the amazing thing too is that, you know, so, some of this music, although people might listen to it for the, the you know, the singer-songwriter, a lot of people react to the music in a visceral way too, you know? I mean, I personally have always been drawn toward drums, the rhythm of it, the lyrics too, but but drums, you know, that feeling behind it and, um, and just the rhythm of the music. So you know that like you putting your take on that and giving the music what it needs could really make the difference in who connects with it, you know? So that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's so, it's, it's the most important thing I think. I love it. I love it. And I don't want to forget to talk about something else that you do, which is super fun. And I love it. And anyone listening right now, listening to your voice can probably understand why you do this, but you do voiceover work and you are the voice of the intro of the Sarah Hagen backstage podcast. So thank very you for that. Drum. Mark. No, very best drum podcast in the world. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, um, you know, we talked years ago about how you had the most perfect voice for voiceover. And then when you started doing some different things and commercials, right? And yeah. I just love that so much. So I I do, um, I was doing a, there's a, an Australian artist called Delta Goodrum. And um, I was doing a, a recording thing for her in London. And um, we, I was early i'm always early i'll be early to everything um I, I turn up and one of the room mics isn't working so the engineers set everything up and i've got the drums set up and um just getting a little sound and, and he keeps walking in and out of the studio you know oh this oh, isn't you know sound of, and i was like do you just want me to just stay here and talk into the mic while you're you know trying to work things out on the other side of the glass I was like, oh yeah, if you wouldn't mind. So I was just talking into this mic and then it got stupid. I was mucking around and doing these voices and uh, <laughs> came back in and was like, your voice records really well. Have you ever thought about voiceovers? I was like, nah, mate, I'm a drummer, whatever. Um, and he was like, oh no, there's an agent upstairs. You should go and speak to her in the break. And so I was like, I've just forgot about it. And then uh, we, we did a, a couple of things. I think it was, a, I forget what it was, but there were cameras there. So it might've been a live stream for something or other. Um, and went out into the kitchen at one break and there was this lady there and said, oh, are you, are you the drummer that does all the voices? <laughs> and I was like, uh, what do you mean? Not really. I was just mucking around trying to help. Me. I said, no, come upstairs and, and just read some stuff for me. So I, I did. I went upstairs and I read a couple of signs of A4 and different voices and took some direction. And, you know, she'd go, OK, happier this time and sadder this time, and cheesier this time and more salesy this time. <laughs> you know. And... Uh, I did it and she said, okay, great. Well, look, if anything comes in, I'll give you a call. I was like, okay, all right, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I left that, I left that session. I was, I just was in my car. I was closing my boot and, and, um, and she came rushing out of the fire exit right next to where my car was. And, oh, thank God you haven't left. Can you come upstairs and do a Samsung commercial? <laughs> and that was it. I literally, and I, I'm, I'm reticent of telling that story to a lot of my acting friends because they tr they've been, and, and people try for years and years and years to break into voiceover and mm -hmm. voice, voice acting, voice artistry. And, um, and they get really angry when I tell them I basically fell into it. So you do lots of very cheesy adverts for a limited time only. Buy one, get one completely free. But that's not all. Buy now, pay nothing until February 2022. <laughs> uh, it's very, very cheesy. It's so good though. I, I, sometimes things happen like that, right? Like right place at the right time and your voice just fits. It fits like you, you know, I could picture you doing like movie, the uh, the movie intros, right? Like 
I do. Yeah. I do a lot of kids' books uh, lately. You know, um, like uh, right. flipped on his Wish Wellingtons. He was transported to another world. When you hear this noise, turn the page. All that's it. That's so great. That's so great. I would totally listen to that. <laughs> Send you to sleep. <laughs> I have a I have a friend um, from high school actually who is out in California now, but she does a lot of like cartoon voiceovers. Yeah. And I every once in a while I'll either the TV will be on or I'll just all of a sudden hear Allison's voice. And I can hear her, you know, even if she's doing a character, I can hear her. She sings and plays music too, uh, plays guitar um, and ukulele. And I can just hear her and I think, oh my gosh, that's Allison. It's so great. But I did, um, I did one for, um, for Sky Broadband and uh, I'd get friends texting me. It was for Sky Broadband, but uh, <clears throat> their answer phone service. So if you'd like to speak to Billing, press one. For all other inquiries, please hold. You're cool, important to us. All this sort of stuff. There was this awful background music while you were waiting on the phone. This whole music, and occasionally I'd pop up and go, "Your call is important to us." Please, and I'd get texts from my friends every now and again saying, "You've been telling me my call's important to you for the last forty-five minutes. Now answer the fucking phone." <laughs> so occasionally you get notes. Uh, it's great that I I, can't, I, don't, I don't take it at all seriously because of the drum. I mean, my job is playing the drums, but if somebody mm -hmm. asks me to, you know, I'll do yes. it. Off and they're like, oh, we need this thing right. I'll be like, okay, that's Absolutely. fine. Absolutely, just you're great. Just, fun. You you're so great it. at it. I, and I remember years and years ago, I was like, I need you to record my voicemail. Like, and we tried, and we couldn't make it work because this was before technology was helpful in that way. But, but as soon as this idea for the for the podcast came up. And, you know, just talking about how the intro would go and what it would be. And I was like, I know who would be perfect, perfect to do this. And it's funny how many people tell me like how um, the intro sounds so like um, proper. And, and I'm just like, of course it does. It's Mark. Of course it's it does. It. Professional to do it. Professional. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, guys, the, the folks you've had on this podcast are like, absolutely mental. Like in the most respectful way, you know, <laughs> Gerald, Thank Hayden, you. you know, Gavin and, and all those guys was like, you know, the, Oh the, my gosh. The and I, everyone's been so, so like wonderful to, to participate in this and, and, and come on and chat. It's been so great. And I, so I feel so lucky and thank you so much too. I mean, it just, it means the world to have you all come on and talk and share. I mean, you gave some really great advice and insights and it's just so valuable, I think, to uh, to listeners to hear some of this stuff. And, and let me not forget too, because this will be released on Tuesday, July 15th, right? That's a Tuesday. Which, my birthday's on the 16th. And I was just going to say, which happens to be the day before your birthday. So let's wish you a happy birthday. Jingle bells. Yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> older, so, and, you know. Right? And maybe maybe you cannot have a quarantine birthday this year. Are you guys still? No, nope, we come out of quarantine on the 19th. Oh. Um, I, I, I'm, my birthday's on the 16th, and we're going to out of quarantine on the 19th. But we're allowed to meet in groups of six. And so oh, good. my friends are going white water rafting for my birthday. <gasps> That's fantastic. That is one of the funnest things ever. I've done that before and yeah. um, managed to stay in the raft, but I, I hear it's easy to, to fall out. So well, we'll see. <laughs> I, so. I like water. It's good fun. But yeah, we're going to a place called the Lee Valley Center, which is where they did the Olympics. When they did the, the Olympics in, in the UK, 2012 Olympics, there was mm -hmm. a this this uh, this slalom basically for whitewater rafting, and we're going to the we're going to that site. Oh, that's exciting! That sounds like a yeah. blast. And I totally got next week's date wrong. It actually Tuesday is the thirteenth, so it'll oh, be a few days, a few days before your birthday. Yeah, but, yeah. but yeah. we'll all we'll all be wishing you a happy birthday from afar, and I hope you have a blast whitewater rafting. Yeah, sure Can't will. wait to see pictures from that. Yeah, I'm sure we will. That'll be really good fun. It sounds like so much fun. And so what should we look for from you coming up for the rest of the year and into 2022? Well, uh, there's some um, there's some nice little recording bits, which I've done in the last uh, few months, um, which uh, will become apparent on 
on media in the stuff. future I'm yeah really, <laughs> yeah i'm really bad at the social media thing like i mean i, I do it I, I participate in it and i you know I'm, I'm i'm on it just because you know why not but um i think a lot of it's pretty bad but i'll i'll i'll, I'll egg out some stuff as it comes in uncomfortably from my very british home like oh god this is so dick waving it's ridiculous you know um, oh my goodness I'm, go I'm going to just continue texting you and encourage you to post because yeah. you do you should share you do the most amazing things and you share fun stuff which is awesome yeah. um yeah. so that's good too but you should you should do some more self-promotion because you have a lot of great stuff going on and people should see that yeah so there's there's some bits with that as well and there's some uh there's some uh, other folk and I'm doing a show that comes back to the West End in um, perhaps October-ish time and mm -hmm. already booked some time up in December for a little tour um, with someone else. So yeah, it's uh, it's uh, green shoots. It's not, <laughs> it's not back for any of us completely yet, but there are green shoots and hopefully, Absolutely. hopefully everybody, all, me, all my friends, all colleagues, everybody gets back to work and, you know, for sure and it's happening it's happening like you said slowly but it's yeah. happening and I, I think that um you know we can all be really really excited for our friends and i'm so excited for you and you know just seeing the tour posts that are going up and actual live shows and it's like oh, this is really going to happen so just you know my fingers are crossed and everything that it just continues in the right direction and everybody gets back to doing what they love to do and being creative again, um, and you as well. And thank you again, Mark, for being my guest today. It's so great to see you and catch up. You too. Um, have a wonderful birthday, and we'll put some links in the YouTube description so people can follow you and see what you're up to yeah. um, and check out your music. Brilliant, thanks, Sarah. Thank you, see you soon. Bye. Thank you for tuning in today. Join us each Tuesday for new episodes of Sarah Hagen Backstage.